Hi, I'm Peter Burkrat, and for Hanukkah, I'm going to be reading you two stories. The first is from the book Zlata the Goat and Other Stories, because every good tale should have an animal attached to it. Zlata the Goat and Other Stories is written by Isaac Bashiva Singer, and the illustrations in this book are by Maurice Sendak, who you may know from Where the Wild Things Are. So the first story is Zlata the Goat. There's a picture of Zlata and her boy. At Hanukkah time, the road from the village to the town is usually covered with snow, but this year the winter had been a mild one. Hanukkah had almost come, yet little snow. Hanukkah had almost come, yet little snow had fallen. The sun shone most of the time. The peasants complained that because of the dry weather. There would be a poor harvest of winter grain. New grass sprouted, and the peasants sent their cattle out to pasture. For Reuven the furrier, it was a bad year, and after long hesitation, he decided to sell Zlata the goat. She was old and gave little milk. Fivel the town butcher had offered eight gulden for her. Such a sum would buy Hanukkah candles, potatoes, and oil for pancakes, gifts for the children. And other holiday necessities for the home. Reuven told his oldest boy Aaron to take the goat to town. Aaron understood what taking the goat to Fivel meant, but he had to obey his father. Leah, his mother, wiped the tears from her eyes when she heard the news. Aaron's younger sisters, Anna and Miriam, cried loudly. Aaron put on his quilted jacket and a cap with earmuffs, bound a rope around Zlata's neck. And took along two slices of bread with cheese to eat on the road. Aaron was supposed to deliver the goat by evening, spend the night at the butcher's, and return the next day with the money. While the family said goodbye to the goat, and Aaron placed the rope around her neck, Zlata stood as patiently and good-naturedly as ever. She licked Reuven's hand. She shook her small white beard. Zlata trusted human beings. She knew that they always fed her and never did her any harm. When Aaron brought her out on the road to town, she seemed somewhat astonished. She'd never been led in that direction before. She looked back at him questioningly, as if to say, "Where are you taking me?" But after a while, she seemed to come to the conclusion that a goat shouldn't ask questions. Still, the road was different. They passed new fields, pastures, and huts with thatched roofs. Here and there, a dog barked and came running after them, but Aaron chased it away with his stick. The sun was shining when Aaron left the village. Suddenly, the weather changed. A large black cloud with a bluish center appeared in the east, and spread itself rapidly over the sky. A cold wind blew in. The crows flew low, croaking. At first, it looked as if it would rain, but instead, it began to hail as if in summer. It was early in the day, but it became dark as dusk. After a while, the hail turned to snow. In his twelve years, Aaron had seen all kinds of weather, but he had never experienced a snow like this one. It was so dense it shut out the light of day. In a short time, their path was completely covered. The wind became as cold as ice. The road to town was narrow and winding. Aaron no longer knew where he was. He could not see through the snow. The cold soon penetrated his quilted jacket. At first, Zlata didn't seem to mind the change in weather. She too was twelve years old and knew what winter meant. But when her legs sank deeper and deeper into the snow, she began to turn her head and look at Aaron in wonderment. Her mild eyes seemed to ask, "Why are we out in such a storm?" Aaron hoped that a peasant would come along with his cart, but no one passed by. The snow grew thicker, falling to the ground in large whirling flakes. Beneath it, Aaron's boots touched the softness of a plowed field. He realized that he was no longer on the road; he had gone astray. He could no longer figure out which was east or west. Which way was the village, the town? 
The wind whistled, howled, whirled the snow about in eddies. It looked as if white imps were playing tag on the fields. A white dust rose above the ground. Zlata stopped. She could walk no longer. Stubbornly, she anchored her cleft hooves in the earth and bleated as if pleading to be taken home. Icicles hung from her white beard, and her horns were glazed with frost. Aaron did not want to admit the danger. But he knew just the same that if they did not find shelter, they would freeze to death. This was no ordinary storm. It was a mighty blizzard. The snowfall had reached his knees. His hands were numb and he could no longer feel his toes. He choked when he breathed. His nose felt like wood and he rubbed it with snow. Zlata's bleating began to sound like crying. Those humans in whom she had so much confidence had dragged her into a trap. Aaron began to pray to God for himself and for the innocent animal. Suddenly, he made out the shape of a hill. He wondered what it could be, who had piled snow into such a huge heap. He moved toward it, dragging Zlata after him. When he came near it, he realized that it was a large haystack which the snow had blanketed. And here we see Zlata and Aaron, and just over here there's a little haystack covered with snow. Aaron realized immediately that they were saved. With great effort, he dug his way through the snow. He was a village boy and knew what to do. When he reached the hay, he hollowed out a nest for himself and the goat. No matter how cold it may be outside, in the hay it is always warm. And hay was food for Zlata. The moment she smelled it, she became contented and began to eat. Outside, the snow continued to fall. It quickly covered the passageway Aaron had dug. But a boy and an animal need to breathe, and there was hardly any air in their hideout. Aaron bored a kind of window through the hay and snow and carefully kept the passage clear. Zlata, having eaten her fill, sat down on her hind legs and seemed to have regained her confidence in man. Aaron ate his two slices of bread and cheese, but after the difficult journey he was still hungry. He looked at Zlata and noticed her udders were full. He lay down next to her, placing himself so that when he milked her, he could squirt the milk into his mouth. It was rich and sweet. Zlata was not accustomed to being milked that way, but she did not resist. On the contrary, she seemed eager to reward Aaron for bringing her to a shelter whose very walls, floor, and ceiling were made of food. Through the window, Aaron could catch a glimpse of the chaos outside. The wind carried before it whole drifts of snow. It was completely dark, and he did not know whether night had already come or whether it was the darkness of the storm. Thank God that in the hay it was not cold. The dried hay, grass, and field flowers exuded the warmth of the summer sun. Zlata ate frequently. She nibbled from above, below, from the left and the right. Her body gave forth an animal warmth, and Aaron cuddled up next to her. He had always loved Zlata, but now she was like a sister. He was alone, cut off from his family, and wanted to talk. He began to talk to Zlata. Zlata, what do you think about what has happened to us? He asked. <laughs> Zlata answered. If we hadn't found this stack of hay, we would both be frozen stiff by now, Aaron said. <laughs> was the goat's reply. If the snow keeps on falling like this, we may have to stay here for days, Aaron explained. <laughs> Zlata bleated. What does ma mean? Aaron asked. You'd better speak up clearly. Ma! <laughs> ma! Zlata tried. Well, let it be ma then. Aaron said patiently. You can't speak, but I know you understand. 
I need you, and you need me. Isn't that right? Ma. Aaron became sleepy. He made a pillow out of some hay, leaned his head on it, and dozed off. Zlata, too, fell asleep. Here's a picture of Aaron and Zlata nestled in the hay, in their little cave of hay. When Aaron opened his eyes, he didn't know whether it was morning or night. The snow had blocked up his window. He tried to clear it, but when he had bored through to the length of his arm, he still hadn't reached the outside. Luckily, he had his stick with him and was able to break through to the open air. It was still dark outside. The snow continued to fall and the wind wailed, first with one voice and then with many. Sometimes it had the sound of devilish laughter. Zlata too awoke, and when Aaron greeted her, she answered, Ma! Yes. Zlata's language consisted of only one word, but it meant many things. Now she was saying, We must accept that God gives us all. Heat, cold, hunger, satisfaction, light and darkness. Aaron had awakened hungry. He had eaten up his food, but Zlata still had plenty of milk. For three days, Aaron and Zlata stayed in the haystack. Aaron had always loved Zlata, but in these three days he loved her more and more. She fed him with her milk and helped him to keep warm. She comforted him with her patience. He told her many stories, and she always cocked her ears and listened. When he patted her, she licked his hand and his face. Then she said, mm -hmm. And he knew it meant, I love you too. The snow fell for three days, though after the first day it was not as thick and the wind quieted down. Sometimes Aaron felt that there could never have been a summer, that the snow had always fallen ever since he could remember. He, Aaron, never had a father or mother or sisters. He was a snow child, born of the snow, and so was Lotta. It was so quiet in the hay that his ears rang in the stillness. Aaron and Zlata slept all night and a good part of the day. As for Aaron's dreams, they were all about warm weather. He dreamed of green fields, trees covered with blossoms, clear brooks and singing birds. By the third night, the snow had stopped, but Aaron did not dare to find his way home in the darkness. The sky became clear and the moon shone, casting silvery nets on the snow. Aaron dug his way out and looked at the world. It was all white, quiet, dreaming dreams of heavenly splendor. The stars were large and close. The moon swam in a sea of stars, swam in the sky as in a sea. On the morning of the fourth day, Aaron heard the ringing of sleigh bells. The haystack was not far from the road. The peasant who drove the sleigh pointed out the way to him, not to the town and five of the butcher, but home to the village. Aaron had decided in the haystack that he would never part with Slaughter. Aaron's family and their neighbors had searched for the boy and the goat, but had found no trace of them during the storm. They feared they were lost. Aaron's mother and sisters cried for them. His father remained silent and gloomy. Suddenly, one of the neighbors came running to their home with the news that Aaron and Slaughter were coming up the road. There was great joy in the family. Aaron told them how he had found the stack of hay and how Zlata had fed him with her milk. Aaron's sisters kissed and hugged Zlata and gave her a special treat of chopped carrots and potato peels, which Zlata gobbled up hungrily. Nobody ever again thought of selling Zlata. And now that the cold weather had finally set in, the villagers needed the services of Reuven the Furrier once more. When Hanukkah came, Aaron's mother was able to fry pancakes every evening, and Zlata got her portion too. 
even though Zlata had her own pen. She often came to the kitchen, knocking on the doors with her horns to indicate that she was ready to visit. And she was always admitted. In the evening, Aaron, Miriam, and Anna played dreidel. Zlata sat near the stove watching the children and the flickering of the Hanukkah candles. Once in a while, Aaron would ask her, Zlata, do you remember the three days we spent together? And Zlata would scratch her neck with a horn, shake her white-bearded head, and come out with the single sound which expressed all her thoughts and all her love. Zlata the Goat by, Ibis, I, by Isaac Beshevis Singer. And now for something completely different. We have for you something a little bit more colorful, a little more lively, maybe not as cold. Herschel and the Hanukkah Goblins by Eric Kimmel. And this wonderful book is illustrated by Trina Shard Hyman. A lot more pictures here. So let's. Oh, I guess it is cold. I guess Hanukkah comes this time of year. There's always a little snow. It was the first night of Hanukkah. Herschel of Ostropol was walking down the road. He was tired and hungry. Nonetheless, his step was light. Soon he would reach the next village, where bright candles, merry songs, and platters piled high with tasty potato latkes awaited him. But when he arrived, the village was silent and dark. Not a single Hanukkah candle could be seen. You see, the village is all dark. Well, it's a big village, but what's happening? Isn't tonight the first night of Hanukkah? Herschel asked the villagers. We don't have Hanukkah, Herschel. One of them answered sadly. No Hanukkah? How can that be? It's because of the goblins. They haunt the old synagogue at the top of the hill. They hate Hanukkah. Whenever we try to light a menorah, the goblins blow out the candles. They break our dreidels. They throw a potato latkes on the floor. Those wicked goblins make our lives miserable all year long. But on Hanukkah, it's really bad. Herschel knew he must help the village people. I'm not afraid of goblins, he said. Tell me how to get rid of them. It's not as easy as you think, the rabbi warned. You must spend eight nights in the old synagogue. The Hanukkah candles must be lit each night. On the eighth night, the king of the goblins must light them himself. That is the only way to break the power. I'm not afraid, Rabbi, Herschel said. If I can't outwit a few goblins, then my name isn't Herschel of Ostropol. There's the old synagogue, looking a little bit like the haunting of Hill House there. That's a different book by Shirley Jackson. The villagers wished Herschel good luck. They had no potato latkes to give him, so they packed several hard-boiled eggs for him to eat, along with a big jar of pickles. The rabbi gave Herschel a brass menorah, a package of candles, and a box of matches. Then the villagers said goodbye. Nobody expected to see Herschel again. It was long past sundown by the time Herschel climbed to the top of the hill where the old synagogue stood. The crumbling building was gloomy and dark, and rusty hinges squealed as Herschel opened the door. Herschel shuddered. Well could he believe that goblins lived here. He put the two candles in the menorah and set it on the windowsill. He struck a match and lit the Shamus candle. He said the blessings and was about to light the other candle when he heard a voice. Hey, what are you doing? 
Herschel turned around. Here was a goblin no bigger than a horsefly, with a long pointy tail and two little bat's wings hovering in the air. I'm lighting Hanukkah candles, Herschel said. Tonight is the first night of Hanukkah. Oh, look at that little goblin. He's almost cute, isn't he? He's a little cute for a goblin. Oh, no, it's not. We don't allow Hanukkah. Not around here. Is that so? said Herschel. Who's gonna stop me? A little pipsqueak like you? I may be little, but I'm strong, said the goblin. Really? Can you crush rocks in your hand? asked Herschel. The goblin laughed. Crush rocks? You're joking. Nobody's that strong. I am. Watch. Look at that. Look what he's doing. Herschel took a hard-boiled egg from his pocket and squeezed it until the yolk and the white ran through his fingers. That's how hard I'm going to squeeze you if you try to stop me from lighting these candles. The little goblin's eyes opened wide, since in the dim light the egg looked exactly like a rock. The little goblin shook with fear. You leave me alone, he squeaked. Gladly, said Herschel if you let me light my candles in peace. All right, said the goblin. One night won't make a difference. But you better not be here tomorrow. Big, scary goblins are coming, much bigger than I. If they catch you lighting Hanukkah candles, you'll be sorry. We'll see about that, Herschel said to himself. He lit the first candle. Oh... Look what's coming. Oh, my goodness. I'm so nervous. I'm sweating. Oi. On the second night, another goblin appeared. This one was big and fat and waddled like a goose. Herschel was finishing his dinner of pickles and hard-boiled eggs. Have some pickles, he said to the goblin. Pickles? Here, catch. Herschel tossed him a sour pickle. The goblin caught it in his mouth. Blah, 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 I have a pickle in my mouth. Here, catch! Herschel tossed him a sour pickle. The goblin caught it in his mouth and swallowed it. Mmm, pickles are good. Do you like them? I have plenty in this jar. Take all you want. The greedy goblin grabbed as many pickles as his claws could hold. But when he tried to pull his fist out of the jar, he couldn't. I'm stuck, the goblin shouted. You put a spell on this jar to hold me fast. That's right, Herschel said, laughing. And it's a very powerful spell. You came here tonight to stop me from lighting Hanukkah candles. So now I am going to light them while you stand with your hand in that jar and watch. How do you like that? No! No! The goblin screamed. I hate Hanukkah! Oh, look at him, look at him. Oh, my goodness, he's having a bad goblin night. Too bad. You'll have to get used to it. Herschel said the blessings and lit the candles. Slowly. Then he sang all his favorite Hanukkah songs. The goblin wailed and carried on so much that Herschel... Oh, I think there's a goblin here. The goblin wailed and carried on so much that Herschel finally decided to let him go. Shall I take you... Oh, shall I tell you how to break the spell? Yes, yes! I can't stand it anymore! Let go of the pickles. Your greed is the only spell holding you prisoner. You see, his hand is stuck in the jar. The goblin let go of the pickles. His hand slipped out of the jar easily. How that goblin raged! He had stood with his hand in a pickle jar while Herschel lit Hanukkah candles under his nose. And look at that nose. The furious goblin stamped his foot so hard that he shattered into a million pieces. The wind blew them away. Oh, what's going to happen with this fella? The third night came. 
Herschel felt something watching him as he set the candles in the menorah. Instead of lighting them, he began playing with the dreidel. An hour passed. Herschel looked up. Sitting across the table was another goblin. This one had a fiery red face and two enormous horns. It's getting late, the goblin said. When are you going to light the candles? Later. There's plenty of time. Herschel spun his dreidel. This is more fun. What are you playing with? the goblin asked. It looks like a top. It's a dreidel. Don't you know about dreidels? No. Too bad. Dreidels are a lot of fun. You can also make lots of money if you know how to play. Really? The goblin was interested now. All goblins like money. This one was no exception. How do you play? It's very simple, Herschel said. But you must have gold. That's the first rule. I have plenty. Is this enough? The goblin poured a pile of gold coins onto the table. Look at that. He doesn't even have pockets. It's crazy. Oh, and look, now they're playing, Dreidel. They can look at that and think about that. That's fine, Herschel said. Listen carefully now. This letter is Shin. If it comes up, you give me a handful of gold. This letter is hay. If it comes up, you give me half your gold. This is gimel. If the dreidel falls on this letter, you give me all your gold. Understand? Wait. There's one letter left. What about this one? That's none. If the dreidel falls on none, I don't give you anything. Ready? Let's play. You go first. The goblin spun the dreidel. The little top whirled round and round. When it fell, the letter on top was Shin. Too bad, Herschel said, taking a big handful of the goblin's gold. Try again. Maybe you'll have better luck. The goblin spun the dreidel once more. This time it fell on hay. This isn't your night, Herschel said, helping himself to half the goblin's gold. One more time. Your luck is bound to improve. Once again, the goblin spun. This time, the dreidel landed on Gimel. Too bad. Herschel sighed as he took the rest of the goblin's gold. Would you like me to spin? Yes, the goblin grumbled. He was very unhappy about losing his money. Herschel spun the dreidel. This time the letter none was on top. Oh my, I don't give you anything. I get to keep all the gold. Say, that was fun. Get some more gold and we'll play again. What about the Hanukkah candles? Well, light them later. There's plenty of time. Not for me, the goblin said. I'm leaving now. I don't like this game. I don't like Hanukkah. And I don't like you. Don't go, Herschel pleaded. I know lots of games. Stay a while. We'll have fun. Good bye. The goblin spread his wings, swooped out the door, and flew off into the night. Herschel lit the candles all by himself. And here's the, the penultimate moment, as we say. The goblin is really annoyed, and Herschel is lighting his candles. Oh, my goodness. Oh, I didn't think I can even go on. It's too scary. All right, I'll go on. On the following nights, other goblins came. One had six heads. One had three eyes. They were all terrible and fierce. They growled and roared and changed themselves into horrible shapes. They tried to stop Herschel from lighting the Hanukkah candles. But Herschel fooled them all. Look at this. There's one with three eyes and six heads and 
I don't know. That guy looks okay. But I'm used to them by now. Finally, the seventh night arrived. Eight tiny candles flickered on the windowsill. Herschel sat back to enjoy their light. Where were the goblins? Had they finally given up? Herschel felt very sleepy. His eyes closed. Suddenly he sat up. He heard a horrible sound. A voice that sounded like the cracking of bones. Happy Hanukkah, Herschel of Ostrapol. Who is it? Who is there? Don't you know who I am, Herschel? Weren't you expecting the King of the Goblins? The voice rose to a hurricane roar. It ripped the shingles from the synagogue roof and shattered the windows. The Hanukkah candles reeled in the savage blast, but they did not go out. You're too early! Herschel shrieked. You're not supposed to come until tomorrow! The wind, the great, great wind died down. Don't worry, Herschel. I am far away. But I have the power to see you and speak to you. Enjoy this Hanukkah evening, my friend. It will be your last. Tomorrow night, I will come for you. You fooled my slaves, my other goblins. Let's see if you can fool me. Poor Herschel. What was he to do? The king of the goblins was on his way, and now no power on earth could stop him. Unless, ooh, unless, Herschel had an idea. It was a big chance, but he had to take it. It was the only way to save himself and Hanukkah. And look, there's the wind and the shattering glass and I think some pickles. Herschel's hat, oh my goodness. The king of the goblins must be very fierce. Oh, I'll give you a preview, look at him. Oh my God, he's very, very scary. You okay? Okay. It was the last night of Hanukkah. Herschel set the candles in the menorah. But instead of placing it on the windowsill, he put the menorah and the box of matches on a small table near the door. Then he sat down to wait. Night fell. It grew dark as pitch inside the gloomy old synagogue. Outside, the whole world lay cold and silent. Suddenly, a great gust ripped the synagogue door from its hinges. The whole building shook. A fearsome voice spoke. Herschel of Ostrapol. Did I hear something? It is I, the king of the goblins! Herschel laughed. Don't be silly. You're one of the boys from the village. You're trying to scare me. I am not a boy. I am the king of the goblins. I believe it when I see it. Show yourself to me. Behold! I stand before you. Do you believe me now? Herschel tried not to look. Even in the darkness, he could see the outline of a monstrous shape filling the doorway. A figure too horrible to describe. He pretended not to care. It's too dark, I can't see anything. A candlestick and some matches are by the doorway. Why don't you light a few candles? Then I'll see what you really are. Indeed you shall! A match flared. The Shamus candle caught the flame. Herschel's blood turned to water at the awful sight before him. But he did not lose courage. Master of the world, he silently prayed. Thou who created the heavens and the earth and the spirits of the air, 
Stand by me now. Then he addressed the goblin. It's still too dark. What are you afraid of? There are plenty of candles. Why don't you light them all? A hideous hand took the shamus candle and lit the others one by one. Herschel felt himself growing faint, but he forced himself to look. His eyes grew wider and wider as each candle caught the flame. Six, seven, eight. The king of the goblins stood before him. Now, Herschel, do you know who I am? I know you're not Queen Esther. Very funny. Enjoy the joke. It will be your last. That's what you think. Be gone or I'll take a stick to you. How dare you speak to the king of the goblins that way? I'll speak to you any way I please. You have no power. Your spell is broken, see? The menorah is lit. You thought those were ordinary candles you were lighting. They weren't. They were Hanukkah candles. And you lit them yourself. Oh, the king of the goblins roared with fury. The earth trembled and a mighty wind arose. It ripped the synagogue roof and blew down the walls. It splintered the great timbers and scattered them like matchsticks. Look at that. Around the menorah the whirlwind howled, but the candles never flickered. They burned with clear, steady flames. The king of the goblins had no power over them. The spirit of Hanukkah had triumphed. The great wind vanished as suddenly as it had risen. Herschel rubbed his eyes. The night was as still as before, even though the synagogue was gone. Walls, floor, roof, even the foundation stones had vanished. But the menorah remained, standing tall upon the little table where Herschel had placed it. And there it is, burning brightly. Herschel waited until the last candle burned out. Then he started down the road that led to the village. I'd better hurry, he thought. I don't want to miss the last night of Hanukkah. But there was no reason to worry. In every window, there stood a menorah with nine gleaming candles to light the way. The whole village was waiting for him. And look at the village now, all lit up with the people outside. I'm going to read that again, because that's the end. But there was no reason to worry. This is how you finish a book. But there was no reason to worry. In every window there stood a menorah with nine gleaming candles to light the way. The whole village was waiting for him. And that's how you finish a book. Happy Hanukkah.